This is the Gadget Flow podcast, the show about everything related to products, entrepreneurship, marketing, and crowdfunding. And this week, we have an awesome interview with George Manley. And George has helped countless massive brands like some of the biggest brands on the planet succeed in the world of dropshipping, retail, and sales. So we had a great conversation full of useful information about the journey of becoming an entrepreneur. So without further ado, here is my interview with George Manley. George, thank you so much for joining us on the Gadget Flow podcast, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Alex. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. We're excited to have you on. Uh, I have a few questions for you today. And first, I like to do a little bit of an introduction, um, maybe for our audience who doesn't know or who don't know who you are or what it is you do. Would you mind just giving a little bit of background into into who you are? Yeah. So I was, uh, well, I'm going back to college, I actually studied journalism uh, at the University of Maryland, um, graduated from their College of Journalism in 2000. And, um, and after a couple of quick stints in journalism, working at ABC News in Washington, D.C. with 2020, and then I worked uh, with WTOP, which is the all news radio station in Washington, D.C., um, I made my way to New York. And in New York, I initially was hoping to hook up with Katie Couric and become a page uh, for NBC, which is a, sort of their leadership training program. Um, okay. And uh, found out it only makes $10 an hour and realized I can't live in New York City doing that. So I made my way, <laughs> <laughs> made my way into sales. Um, and as soon as I got into sales, I was in uh, working actually for a company called Cintas. It's a, a great company. Or actually, at the time, they were the fifth largest apparel manufacturer in the United States. Most people don't realize that, but they're, they're a uniform company. So they do cruise lines and carnival, uh, lines or carnival, uh, carnival cruise lines is one of the companies, but they do cruise lines, they do hotels, they do, uh, um, uh, um, Las Vegas casinos, Atlantic city casinos, they do restaurants, you know, chef wear, just about every uniform yeah. you can think of. And so I worked for them for five years, really got an understanding of apparel manufacturing, loved it, was the top salesperson in that company for three of the five years I was there um, within the division I was in. And then I ended up um, saying, all right, if I like to sell clothes, why don't I start selling something that I'm really excited about? And so I, I started applying to fashion jobs and I ended up being a an executive in the fashion industry in New York for about 11 years. Um, and I ran Brooks Brothers Wholesale Sales. I ran the sales for a bridal couturier called Priscilla of Boston. Um, I was a consultant to the menswear industry for many years. Um, mm. I ended up running the Chelsea Markets retail concourse floor and all of their sample sales and all the fun stuff that goes on there in, in Chelsea. And, um, and that led me to my current gig, um, which is working for uh, Rev Cascade which is a, uh, an online uh, marketplace and platform for um, essentially linking up brands and retailers and allowing them to automate their drop shipping experience. Yeah, man, that's a lot of stuff. It's <laughs> a big background, big portfolio of work, man. That's, that's really, really cool. So um, yeah, so I guess, I mean, so right now your, your primary focus is uh, Rev Cascade, correct? Yeah, I, I also own with my fiance um, a company called Buckheimer NYC, which is a leather goods brand, and um, we're growing that slowly. We bought it, developed it two years ago, and and uh, we've got some great retailers that are buying those bags. We make all of our men's products in New Jersey, actually, and our and our women's stuff in Italy, and um, we're slowly building that business. Caitlin's running those businesses. Um, as I focus on Rev Cascade and Solar, which is the uh, direct to consumer dot com side of Rev Cascade, and then the last piece of what we have, which is like many other people, we just we have a real estate investment. We've got a VR, you know, an Airbnb and VRBO property. Nice, cool, man. Yeah, I was I was checking out that site earlier, and the the leather goods are beautiful. 
super high quality. They look awesome. So we'll make sure to include that that link in the show notes for people to check out. Because uh, yeah, I was very impressed by that by that site. Checking it. Um, so maybe maybe for people who don't know, I mean, drop shipping is kind of uh, it's a little bit of like a buzzword right now in the in the people trying to become entrepreneurs and all that stuff. But for a lot of people, still don't know what it is. Could you describe drop shipping briefly? Yeah. So drop shipping in a nutshell is, um, you know, any direct to consumer, uh, retailer, typically it's, it's their, uh, it's their dot com arm is, uh, interested in selling, you know, as many goods as they can. And, you know, most stores only have so much, uh, real estate or square footage, so to speak. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, they can only fit so many things in their store. So, uh, well, it's the same thing with their dot com side as well. Really, the, the the e-commerce side of many retailers business is really just another store for them. And they have a warehouse where they store that product. And sometimes they're omni channel where they'll pull product from their stores to fill e-commerce orders. But in all of that, the story is the same. They only have so much square footage, whether it's their warehouse or their stores. They only have so much open to buy with which to purchase products to fill those two places. And so drop shipping came about. It's it's really it was primarily uh pioneered by Amazon. Um, it's about 60% of their overall business. It's a hundred percent of what Wayfair does. It's a hundred percent of what Farfetch does. Um, drop shipping is listing, uh, products on your.com that you don't actually own or take into your own warehouse. Um, they're shipping right from the manufacturer's warehouse. So you're listing them on your website for sale, but when it sells on your website, it's being, delivered uh, by the brand directly out of their warehouse. And typically the brands will take a little bit more of uh, of the sale than they otherwise would um, when you were buying it in a wholesale environment. Right. So drop shipping, I mean, I've, I've dabbled a little bit myself in it and it is, it can be a real uh, win-win for both because you're not having to, you know, have a warehouse with all this stuff in it. If you're selling like you, you pretty much just need to focus on the marketing and selling of the goods. Um, and you're not worried about the inventory and the actual, uh, housing of the product where you're going to put all of it. You don't have boxes lining up in your house. Um, that kind of thing, which is really, really nice. Um, so yeah, man. I mean, I know you you definitely seem to have like an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I mean, it looks like you started and been a part of a ton of companies and things throughout the years. And I would just, I would love to hear your thoughts and maybe some tips that you would teach your younger self about, uh, about entrepreneurship when you were getting started. Like what would you teach your younger self now if you could? Um, to be honest with you, I would repeat a lot of the same mistakes and successes that I had. Um, you know, it was sort of throwing my head against the wall and working hard and taking some risk that allowed me to get to where I am. And by no means am I where I ultimately hope to be. I do feel much more informed and comfortable as an entrepreneur who's got to sort of get up every day and, and, and make his paycheck. You know, I don't have an inbound salary from really any of the companies that I'm working with. Um, and that's always been motivator for being in sales. Um, you've got to, you've got to earn your paycheck, but you also can earn as much as, as you work, you know, uh, right. or as much as you succeed, I should say at that work. Um, and so, um, you know, my, it's, it's less, I think what I would tell my, my younger self and more just what I would say in general about being an entrepreneur and what I've, what I've found that's been successful for me is, um, is just, is just going at it is just, you know, considering every opportunity and every conversation, um, a chance to, you know, move your concept or your product or your uh, company forward. And you never know who's going to, um, be able to help you. You never know who's going to teach you, uh, some new lesson, um, in, in, in your business or in the development of your company. And, um, so I keep that, you know, sort of message in the back of my head every day. I just, I'm polite to everyone. I consider everybody a customer. I can consider everybody an investor. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm always working to, uh, to get my message out there and improve my message. Yeah, absolutely, man. You, you said that you took risks and you're happy with the risks you took. Is there, is there one that, you, that stands out to you that kind of changed the game? 
Absolutely. Um, the, the one that, that is on the tip of my tongue right now, I mean, I've got, I've got a lot of big ones. Um, but, uh, the one that, that I really want to talk about right this second is, is what I did last year. So literally a year ago, I was running around with, um, with trail cross, which is the sales agency that I've owned for the last, um, seven years. And it was sort of always my LLC that sat on the side as I consulted for other people, I would take money into that LLC. That's where I would, I would bring, um, you know, the initial sales of some of the goods that we were selling, um, because we didn't know if the concept would take off that deserved, uh, setting up a separate entity with licensing and all that that goes with it, collecting sales tax, et cetera. You know, th there's a lot of work in the initial setup of a new, of a new business. Um, and so, uh, last year I was running around as a consultant selling a couple of brands, um, working on hundred percent commission and basically everything I sold, I got a piece of that sale and in running around and selling to retailers like Nordstrom and Cabela's and Neiman Marcus and Saks and, and, and Bloomingdale's, I kept hearing the word drop ship. Um, they would say, yeah, great. We'll buy, you know, these four or five pieces, but then can you drop ship the rest of the line? And I would say, I think so. <laughs> Let me find out. And I'd go back yeah. to the brands and I'd ask them. And sure enough, a lot of them really weren't set up for it or they didn't know much about it. And so it got me thinking, you know, if I'm going to survive in, in, in the retail world, right, whether it's fashion or outdoor goods or, or other things that I've sold in the past, I've got to get on the e-commerce side of, of what's going on because it's the fastest growing form of retail in the world. And I've specifically got to learn more about dropship because all these retailers keep asking me about it. So I mm -hmm. uh, eventually, through calling a lot of people and, and finding out who I know uh, that knows people that are either uh, working within uh, e-commerce or um, uh, want to work within e-commerce and know a lot about it, I, I met Josh Wexler, who is the CEO of RevCascade and Solar.com. And um, I essentially pushed my way into his life. <laughs> I think he would literally <laughs> describe it as that. I, I told him, I have a set of retailers that are very large that want to deal in a more significant way in the dropship world. And I have relationships there and I could essentially introduce your product to them and make us both money. Um, and at first he was skeptical. He's a startup, so he really didn't have the money to pay me. And so I worked for him for free uh, for six, six of the last 12 months and essentially, you know, proved my worth. And uh, I'm now on a, a full package with him and I'm an investor in the company and I'm, you know, uh, um, I've, I've brought other investors to him who have invested. And, and I, I really feel that I'm an integral piece of what's going on there now. I mean, we're a small team. We're only 12 people, but it's really exciting. And I think what we have going on is amazing. And, and the team, particularly Josh, is, is they're, they're some of the greatest people I've ever worked for. Yeah. Definitely, man. That is, that's an awesome story. Um, for, are there any like resources like for people, you know, are there any books about drop shipping or good blogs or, you know, do you guys provide anything like that? Or do you know of anything good that people could, you know, how, how to research it well to learn, to learn more about it? Um, well, drop ship in, in particular is, is talked about, you know, almost every day, um, in, in, you know, right. somewhere out, out in the, uh, in the world of, of what's going on. And, um, uh -huh. and, you know, WWD, which is the trade publication for the fashion industry talks about it a lot. They, you know, they're, they're actually, they had a full spread on, on the dot com side of retail within fashion today in their, uh, in their publication. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's the, the question for so many people, including a lot of the retailers that I've been working with is, um, is how how do we make dropship successful for us? How do we how do we uh, figure out a way to add more SKUs to our dot com without adding a ton of overhead by trying to figure out how to make dropship work with our existing systems? Because a lot of retailers out there today, one of the reasons why they can't jump into the uh, the next generation of of how people are buying things is because their systems are outdated and and they have a they have major investments in a lot of like point of sale software and ERP software and, and, you know, their e-commerce platforms might be outdated and don't necessarily, um, you know, work well with API linkups or whatever it might be. So um, it's, it's a lot easier for 
for you know young startup brands to uh, initiate a connection to dropship than it is for a lot of these bigger, tr- more traditional brick and mortar retailers because the easiest way to to connect to dropship, especially with Rev Cascade and Solar, is to open a Shopify store. <laughs> you know because they're they're already yeah. pre built to to make it work. Um, so I don't know of any like general references to dropship out there. Rev Cascade does have a uh, a press page, um, uh, or I should say a blog page that lists articles that are, um, interesting, um, about the dropship community. Um, but I would just tell people to, to Google it and, and learn as much as they can. And, and really for that matter, any subject they're interested in, just become a, a master of your own, uh, destiny by, uh, by learning as much as you can about it. Yeah. That's true, man. It is kind of all in in our hands these days. We can learn as much as we want. And so that is our own, we can control our own destiny a lot more than maybe we we think we can. That's very, very cool. Um, So a couple like quicker, quicker questions for you. Um, What is the worst advice you have been given or have heard uh, being given to young entrepreneurs uh, recently or in general? Uh, Don't quit your day job. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I resonate with that big time. Yeah, <laughs> Could you elaborate a yeah, little bit? Yeah, I, I think that, um, and actually it was most recently told to my fiance, who's a brilliant um, salesperson and a brilliant person in general. And she uh, recently quit a job that she had been working at for seven years. And um, she was very successful there. She was one of their top salespeople and uh, made a lot of money. Um, And it was a hard, you know, it's hard to walk away from, you know, a comfortable job. No matter, Mm -hmm. you know, really what the circumstances are, but, but she had a, you know, a six figure package and, you know, it's also hard to walk away from you know, income that, that you're, you're happy receiving. Um, and she got a lot of advice from mostly older people, um, that, you know, are used to the, are used to the economy that we had sort of 30 years ago where, you know, you work for the same or maybe a couple of companies throughout your career and you build up a retirement and then you begin living your life and actually doing the things you want to do creatively, you know, when, when you're 65, and, um, and you don't do it until then, because if you do uh, quit your job up until that point, you're taking a major risk that might leave you homeless on the streets. And, um, and I don't believe that's true. It, first of all, it's not true in this day and age because there's so much opportunity out there if you go and find it. But I don't, I don't even know that it was true then. Um, I think you have, to, you have to have the ability to take some risk in order to try anything entrepreneurial. and um, you know, the first step is just quitting that day job and getting out there and, and, you know, raising money or running around and learning more about your craft so you can create a business plan or, you know, going to work for somebody who's a potential competitor in that industry so you can learn from the inside out. Mm, That's good, man. That's really good. What would you say, um, maybe one of, or a couple of the greatest challenges that come with starting a successful business? Uh, it's, it's definitely wearing multiple hats. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're almost always wearing more than one hat. You're not just the executor and the CEO who's like, you know, dishing out commands. And then there's a team of people that go out and make that thing, those things happen. Um, you're, you're both the executor, you're, you're the manager, you know, doing the hiring and firing and the coaching and training and motivating, you're, you're the, you know, you're the, the bookkeeper, you're the salesperson, you're the operations person, you're the, you know, in some, in some days you're the cleaning person, you know, I mean, you're just, you've got to just be willing to, you know, do anything, you know, whether it's change a light bulb or, you know, pick up the trash in the office because the new client's coming in or, uh, or make the big pitch. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's wearing many hats and realizing that, you know, you probably have, certain skills that are strong, uh, within those, uh, realms of roles. And you obviously want to ultimately make your position within that new company you're creating focused on, on your strengths. And so build, build an audience or a team around you. That's, that's really strong at the things that you're not good at 
and, and give them the, the freedom and the leeway and the trust to go make that part of your business successful for you as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, man. I think honestly, I've seen, I've worked in organizations and seen companies and, and it seems like the ones that truly thrive are ones that are, uh, they are, aw- they're just aware of their weaknesses and then they empower, like truly empower other people to be really good at the things that they're not good at. And it's kind of like letting people run with their gifts or with their talents in the, in the areas where you're weak. That's how you make a really thriving um, great company. At least that's what I've observed. So I totally I, resonate I with that. Um, so last question I have for you, man, is, uh, uh, what is the biggest piece of advice? Just any advice you could give someone, you know, a 18, 19 year old kid looking to start his first business, um, trying to become an entrepreneur. What is, the, what is a piece of advice you would give them? <sighs> Well, if they're 18 or 19, my advice would be a little different than it would to, to someone who is maybe a specialist in an industry they've been working in a while, uh, working in for a while, and they realize that they've got a better idea than what's currently out there, and they want to jump ship and go start their own company. Well, let's hear both. Um, I think both. All right. To the, to the 18 and the 19-year-old, I would say, um, you know, learn – Learn the way it's done today for a few years before you try and create your uh, you, you, or develop your idea. Um, you know, you, it's so much easier to raise money and to um, hire a team and to convince people that your idea is brilliant if you've got some background and you've got some experience and you've got a resume that points to you doing that successfully as it's set up today. Um, And, 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 you know, everybody, especially young people thinks they think they know a lot, uh, a lot more than, you know, the next guy. But, uh, the reality is there's a lot to learn in every industry and there's probably ideas similar to yours already bubbling up through the existing companies in that industry. Mm. They may not be showing their, their head to the consumer yet, but they might be in development. So by you, uh, seeking out those businesses and applying and, and learning a little bit more about, you know, what your potential customers or competitors, excuse me, are doing in the industry and, and hopefully working there for a few years, you'll, you'll get a better idea of whether your idea is truly revolutionary or not. Um, and then to the older person, um, the more tenured person that maybe already has that experience on their books, um, I would say, go for it. You know, don't, um, don't let uh, fear of uh, jumping ship or taking a risk um, stop you from developing your idea. And uh, as Josh uh, Wexler, who I mentioned before, the CEO at Rev Cascade once once said to me, um, you know, when you have a new idea, you've got to believe in it so much, almost to the point of like being insane. <laughs> yeah, you have to literally like wake up every day and just you know believe in it so much that you're willing to tell anybody who steps in front of you that it's the greatest thing they've ever heard about. And you've got to have that level of um, ambition around your idea to initially get it off the ground and begin building, um, you know, the, the pieces that you need to make a, uh, a well-constructed and successful company. Man, that is so good. I couldn't agree more, man. I think, uh, yeah, your greatest asset, I don't know who it was is, Gary V or one of those guys recently, I heard him say like, your greatest asset is being so obsessed with your thing that you're, you're going to wake up excited to do it every morning. Like that's, that's, what's going to push you really, really far in whatever you have to do. Absolutely. That's a good point. You have to be motivated and enjoy what you're doing. You can't just think it's a good idea. You've got to literally want to see it through to the consumer loving it as well. And you just got to get up every day and, and, and want to get up every day and fight for it. Absolutely. George, thank you so much for your time, man. Where, where can people find you? Where can they connect with you online? Um, the easiest way is, uh, my LinkedIn page. Okay. Uh, and I'm happy to share that URL with you so you can attach it to this, sure. uh, to this recording. Um, but they can also go to, uh, uh, solar.com, which is our direct to consumer website. 
and I'm the head of sales for that business. And they can um, uh, they can find me through inquiring about uh, solar. Okay. Uh, and th- those are probably the two best ways for today. I have a blog as well called Manly's Mission. Um, it was a uh, manlysmission.com. It was a blog about the menswear industry. I, I'm, I'm going to start hopefully writing on it again soon. I haven't touched it in years, but uh, most of my social media, including Instagram, is based around either um, my Manly's Mission blog or Buckheimer NYC, our leather goods business. Right. That makes sense. Cool, man. Well, we'll include all that in the show notes for people to, to connect with you and the projects you're working on. So, man, I, I really appreciate your time. And I think you provided a lot of valuable insights and a lot of good stuff for uh, entrepreneurs and people who are just wanting to make cool stuff. So I appreciate your time, George. Thanks, Alex. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. That was our interview with George Manley. And as you heard, he has a ton of incredible stuff going on. So please go check out the links in the show notes today uh, and make sure to follow everything he's up to. This podcast is made by Gadget Flow, and we are proud to be the number one platform to find new and awesome gadgets. So make sure to keep checking back at our site for all the new products we're curating every single day. We'll be back next week with a new episode, but in the meantime, please go rate and review our show in iTunes. Thank you so much for listening to the Gadget Flow Podcast.